Hello, my name is Jared Sheely, and today I'm interviewing Ed Lutz. Mr. Lutz, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about you know your childhood, where you grew up, where you're from? Well, I grew up in Springfield Township. I went to Roosevelt School, then to Springfield High School, where I was the all metro center <coughs> for the metro Metropolitan League. But it's the only sport I was in because I uh, peddled newspapers, and that took up my time. Was that your only job growing up? Well, no, because then I worked at Kruger Warehouse, driving one of their electric or gas carts. Then I worked at American Anode, cleaning out the vats that had liquid latex in them. And then I went to Goodyear. I worked in a gas mask department there. And after that service, I turned 18. So I enlisted in the Marine Corps. Did, uh, did you have any defining moments growing up? Anything that prepared you for the Marine Corps? I had a very, very marvelous father, mom, and dad. So <clears throat> there was no, no problems. No problems growing up. Only thing I can tell you when I came home and told my mother that I enlisted in the Marine Corps, she was thrilled to death because I had joined the best fighting group in the world and they had never been defeated. What, uh, do, you, do you remember Pearl Harbor, where you were at, what you were doing? I was a senior in high school when Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And that was a shock to everybody. But frankly, I didn't know anything <coughs> about the Japanese, so I thought, well, they won't be around very long. Little did I know. But from then, uh, I went to work for Goodyear. And from Goodyear, when I became 18, I enlisted in the Marine Corps. I didn't want to be drafted. I wanted to select where I was going. So that's where I was. So uh, when you joined the Marine Corps, where, where did you take your basic training at? I took my basic training in San Diego. I was inducted in Chicago, and then they moved me to San Diego. And you're a boot for 13 weeks. And if you survive the 13 weeks, you're a Marine. <laughs> <clears throat> So after you graduated from basic, uh, where did you go to for advanced training? They sent me to the uh, Naval Technical Center, Air Technical Center in Memphis, Tennessee. There I was schooled in learning about the engines that were on the Marine airports, airplanes. And so that was an interesting time, but no, nothing eventual. That eventual. That, <laughs> So after that, you, you were moved to uh, Cherry Point? From Memphis, I went to Cherry Point. But before I went to Cherry Point, I went down to Eagle Mountain Lake in Texas and, and <clears throat> Sabine, Sabine Pass. And this was all part of the training. So then they sent me back to Cherry Point, put me on a train headed west. It was interesting, going west, we were all relaxed and so forth, and I looked out the window at a train going east. My serial number, 910209, was the only numbers on that train. So I knew right then, the Japs didn't have my number in a bullet, I have to watch out for trains. <laughs> but. When we arrived in San Francisco, on Thanksgiving Day, we departed and the ocean was not very kind to us. Most, <clears throat> most of the people there on the ship got sick. I didn't, but you know, they served us greasy pork chops. No wonder they got sick. <laughs> and so then we left San Francisco and really had an uneventful trip to the Solomon Islands. When I approached Guadalcanal, I looked around and I said, there's no tops on those trees. Why? And the answer was, the Japanese snipers 
set up in those trees. And so if there's no place for them to nest, they didn't have to worry about the Japanese snipers. But, you know, Guadalcanal, when I was there, there probably, you know, a thousand Japanese back into the wilderness, but they were not a threat to us. So. How long did you spend on uh, Guadalcanal? Oh, about five, six months. Then from there, why well, we moved on to Leyte, then to Luzon. At, at Luzon, we had an interesting deal. I did not drink, but we had a nice Jeep, and we took off from Manila, went to the brewery down there, and filled up our water cans with beer <laughs> and brought them back for the troops. <laughs> that was fun. But Manila was sad. You could see where it had really been treated pretty roughly with uh, rockets and bombs and so forth. But it was a safe trip down, safe trip back. You have to understand, being in the Air Corps, what we did was we had fixed our planes and flew a couple hundred miles and bombed the enemy. But we were behind the lines, not in the trenches. It's interesting. When I graduated from boot camp and became a Marine, you had a choice to select three areas in the Marine Corps that you'd like to serve in. There were 60 men in the group, 57 of them chose infantry, infantry, infantry. And I said to my friends, what's the matter? Why don't you try to improve your education and move ahead? We joined this outfit to fight. And so I went to the Air Corps. <laughs> Did you, uh, were you ever in uh, any kind of action? Not really. The only uh, uh, time I really felt I was in the war was in Luzon, where uh, the bivouac was identified with rockets from collaborators. And so they put anti-personnel bombs. And when it was all done, then you hear Corman, Corman. That's a really, really chilling call to me. But other than that, that was it. So uh, you were telling me a funny story about your, the beer and how you would store it. Well, the men and now, they passed out <clears throat> a beer every month. And I did not drink. But I was a smart businessman, so I dug a hole in my tent, put the beer in there, cause keep it cool, you see. And then when they had a poker or a dice game, I, I told the guys that I had cold beer, 10 bucks. And they all bought it. So, <laughs> it was quite a lot of money back then. Oh, oh yeah, it was, it was really a lot of fun too. The only thing they had to worry about was the Mindanaos, they were headhunters. And one of them came in our tent one night and did steal one of the uh, fellow's rifles. There was four in a tent. So uh, after, well, you moved to Leyte Golf and then Lausanne, and uh, how long were you on Mindanao for? We was on the Mindanao, I was supposed to six months. And uh, there it, again, was a, a secure island. When I talk about security, the Marines had been there and the Jap did not have a fighting force. Now there were still a few stragglers, but they never was, in my opinion, a threat to us. Um, and uh, how, how involved uh, or how, how much uh, information were you receiving from other areas of the war? Did you keep along well enough with all the other uh, theaters or just? No, nope, I have no information. I, have, I was at that particular time in corporal and they don't tell you anything. <laughs> so uh, you, were, you were preparing um, to invade Japan. And then to now, we were loading LSTs to invade the islands of Japan. That's when Harry Truman dropped the two atomic bombs. And all of us there are convinced we wouldn't be here today because 
it was amazing, the fortification that the Japanese had at Iwo Jima, Okinawa, all the islands. You know, they must have been preparing for a war with us for years and years. So, did that answer your question? Good, yeah. So how, how did you feel about the Japanese after you, you know, spent your time fighting them? You know, when I was in China, the Japanese were there, and if they didn't salute us when we went by, we'd turn around, we'd give them a kick in the butt. So, but. That brings us to our, our next time, uh, question. Uh, you could have returned home to the States, but you chose not to. When it's in Mindanao, I had the opportunity to go back to the States and uh, leave the service. But I thought, well, this country boy from Ohio will probably never get a chance to go to China. So I chose to go to China. On the way to China, we're in an LST. We ran into a typhoon in the China seas. And man, we had to be out there tying down the equipment on the decks better than it was. One of the LSTs had a, about a 12 foot uh, hole inside where one of the seams had broken. How would you like to be out there in a tornado <laughs> fixing that? Because the ship didn't go down. But it was like a buggy whip. Snap, snap, snap. But we arrived safe in China. And you were working, uh, what kind of planes were you working on? Basically it was uh, F-4Us. And uh, the Japanese, uh, the Chinese there, they had P-38s. But we didn't really get much with them. I was assigned, uh, my specialty was uh, engines. And so we had a lot of engines to replace. But the lieutenant gave me the job of driving what we call the cleat track to move the airplanes around. And that was a cushion job. <laughs> it was cold, it was nice and warm in there. One day the captain came by and I, my nickname then was Whitey. Believe it or not, I had hair. <laughs> and the, the captain said, Lieutenant, what's he doing in there? And well, he told him. He said, get him out of there and let him work on the airplanes. So. The lieutenant sent me back to the barracks and said, report tomorrow for the flight line. About an hour and a half later, he, appear, he appears in the barracks. Whitey, that stupid job you had, the guy took over, has already wrecked three planes. So I got my job back. But you know, the, the uh, officer was kind of mean because I was up for a promotion and they made sure I didn't get it. But it was interesting, I visited in China the missionaries and the people that were involved in there were very, very amazing. Of course, at that time, Beijing was old. Hadaman Street was the only street that had lights. The other streets were very, very dark. So we all carried a sidearm to make sure that we didn't get hustled by somebody. It was always interesting. We see all these lovely Chinese girls in fur coats. They were the prostitutes. <laughs> so you were in China for about a year. Yeah. How, how many, did you get to go sightseeing at all and see anything? Yes, I was on the Great Wall of China, the Forbidden City, because really all we, we really there, I don't know what the purpose was to begin with, because there was no, no fighting, and they, I think the Chinese didn't want us there, but the Japs were still there, so we were. Any place I was on those islands, if the Japanese would decide to come back and take them over with a strong infantry force, they could have done that. But we didn't have any Marines or any infantry there to protect us. 
So, do you have any other funny stories that you can remember from your tours overseas? Well, I like the Chinese boys that helped us, and we built a, a little go kart, so to speak. I have a picture of that and the Chinese guy. But it was interesting. The Chinese would occasionally take the uh, beverage cans and fill them up with kerosene. And they put that on the bottom row, and then you know they had a real pyramid of, of empty cans. And when, when they were caught, they were branded as a thief. And the, the area that we were in, the Chinese had an electric fence. And one poor animal crawled under it one time by mistake, and he was fried. But it was a, a good experience. Um, I was not engaged in anything, so I did not bring back any trinkets from there. So uh, after after you got uh, discharged, what uh, what did you do? Well, I was pretty dumb because when I got discharged, I canceled my insurance and went back to work. And then I loved working on airplanes, so the opportunity to come back out of Goodyear Aerospace, there was a Marine Reserve Squadron, so I joined that. I joined that in probably the early part of, I don't remember the year, but no longer, <laughs> I got injured about three months later, they called me to active service. I get married in June, they called me back to active service in October. But again, they sent me to Cherry Point. And we, the Korean battle was on, that's what I was uh, back in for. But at Cherry Point, all of the experienced Marines were getting discharged. So when I arrived, I was a buck sergeant, and I was given the assignment of handling 178 Marines as a service squadron. And so that was fun. I had a tech sergeant in the group. He outranked me, of course. I said to him, I'll run this group, but you have to stay out of my way. And he agreed, because he wanted to work on the one jet engine we had there. Almost all our planes were still radio. And um, going on Liberty, we were not using chopsticks and interested in the Chinese food. We'd always order steak and eggs. But I have to tell you, it was quite a moving seeing the Great Wall of China. It really was, was important. I wrote up an article about it and, and spoke to the church when I came back. And Forbidden City, just another city. But I enjoyed, I'm glad I went. I'm sure I wouldn't be back. <laughs> did, uh, did you do a lot of praying while you were overseas? Were you a very religious person during the war? Not really. You know, I considered myself to be a Christian. I went to church when it was available. But I think it was in uh, Luzon where we built our foxhole. It was right on the path, uh, the path to the flight line. And we put a top on it. And this Marine from Texas, he was an ordinary son of a gun in the States. He was scared to death. Every night he'd just stretch out on the top of that foxhole because we put a top on it. And actually it was very wise because when the Japanese bombed the area, two of the interpersonnel bombs were right on the edge. But I had my top and I had 50 caliber steel plates on the entrance, so we were very comfortable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You didn't have anything else to do with your time. You might as well spend it right. What else did you do to kill time? 
Well, that's about it because uh, we didn't have movie theaters. We didn't have that kind of stuff. So probably read, I don't remember. Did you write letters or correspond at all during the war? Not much. Bear in mind, I didn't have a girlfriend. I just had my mother. <laughs> I have brothers and sisters, but uh, I didn't correspond with them. How do you feel about uh, the current serving military members? I think they have a great assignment. And I think it's a place for all young people to be is in the military because you learn discipline and that's so important and it's missing in so many of our youth today. But if I had a son that was 18, I'd tell him, enlist in the Marine Corps. Because you get so great training and discipline. It's like I told you that I was the head of the squad one in my 60 man platoon. So I think to put me on a place, the platoon sergeant said, every morning I want you to make my bed. So I was in charge of a platoon. I turned to the guy behind me to make the sergeant's bed. Next day, the sergeant said, I gave you that assignment, so do it. So I did. I could have argued with him, but he probably would have buried me. <laughs> <clears throat> well, Mr. Lutz, I want to thank you for your time here. Um, I want to tell you, when I went to Cherry Point, my... NCO quarters weren't available, so we drove back and forth every two weeks from Cherry Point to Akron, 80 mile an hour in a Pontiac. We got picked up speeding every time, and we got fined except the time when I was driving. <laughs> I said to the police officer, boy, I made a mistake. He says, what's that? I said, we usually stop here for dinner. Tonight the weather was nice, so we were moving through. And he listened to my garbage and said, slow it down, get moving. <laughs> so when my sister and her, her son came down to visit us, because I finally got in CO quarters. But when I went into them, something was wrong. And then it hit me. There wasn't a stick of furniture. <laughs> so, you know, a phone call and it bring the furniture in pretty quick. But when my sister and her son came out, we were not there. So uh, he was crawling through the window to get in. But it was a good experience. I don't know whether I told you that in the Korean conflict and all these 178 men, I had two Marines that were specialists on foreign cars. So this colonel bought one. He called me and says, meet me for breakfast. We're driving down to Durham, North Carolina, pick up a French Renault. I want you to drive it back. Well, I was a sergeant. Do you argue with the colonel? Not really. So I met him. And on that way down, we stopped for breakfast. I said, what are you ordering there? He said, grits. Since I've never had grits in my life. Try them. So I did. And put a little honey on them. They're very good. But on the way back, I had to stop at a service place because a French Renault was a piece of cake, a vascular cake, I should say. And <laughs> the men in the, in the repair shop laughed. Here's this full kernel, short, stubby guy getting out of this great big Packard. And here's this big Marine getting out of this little French Renault. But my guys took good care of it. I can recall them saying, we need new wheel bearings. So I called the colonel and said, Colonel, we need these. Fine, meet me tomorrow morning. We'll fly to Washington and pick them up. If I had a colonel, <laughs> eagles on my shoulder, I'd probably still be there. And so that we would do. But he asked me to stay in and go to officer's training. And I said, well, thank you very, very much. but." I want to control my life, and I don't feel that being in the service, I would control my life. And so I said goodbye. 
But on the day I was supposed to exit, go through all the checkout, the papers and so forth, and then knock on the door, there stood a sergeant, here's your checkout papers, all completed. So I didn't have anything to do other than say thank you and leave. Well, I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, is, there any, is there any last things you want to say? Well, I can tell you, I should not, it's not military. <laughs> but no, I enjoyed myself in the service. I was not very smart because I canceled my insurance when I got out. And if you know about that insurance, it was nothing short of a gold mine for people that kept it. But I'm proud that I was a Marine, once a Marine, always a Marine. And I host the Marine Corps birthday party here every year. But that's it. All righty. Thank you, Mr. Left. Okay.